Uh, and so I want to try to highlight a bit of that for you. Uh, but before I do that, I want to introduce to you some, uh, some other very special guests who are here tonight. Uh, tomorrow morning, we host the, the inaugural uh, uh, Board of Visitors meeting for our, our school, and all the members, um, or almost all the members, are here um, at, at this point. Um, and so I want to introduce each of them to you and then encourage you afterwards. I know many of you have classes to run to after this, but those of you that don't, uh, spend a few minutes and come and meet uh, uh, our board members. Uh, and I, I could ask uh, each of the board members to stand as I, as I call your name. So Frank Hanna is the CEO of Hanna Capital. Uh, many of you will recognize from two years ago, Frank uh, uh, spoke here. Uh, I it was in this, in this room, or a piece of this room anyway. Uh, so you'll remember him. And you'll actually remember several of the other board members as well. So welcome to Mr. Hanna. <laughs> Mr. Larry Blandford is uh, right here, um, is recently retired CEO of Green Mountain Coffee, and welcome to him too. Uh, Tim Bush is CEO of Pacific Hospitality Group, chairman of the Napa Institute, also a member of the CUA Board of Trustees, and I believe he's on his way in as we speak, so he'll be joining us. Uh, Sean Filer, you will all remember, because he spoke here just two months ago, so welcome to Mr. Filer. He is uh, president of Equinox Partners and chairman of the American Principles Project. Uh, Michael Millet is a partner at Goldman Sachs, global head of structured finance. So welcome to Mr. Millet. <laughs> Michael is also proud father of Sophie Millet, who is a, a freshman exploratory um, and her dramatic writing was featured in this year's drama department. Um, so I'm not sure we're going to get much luck in bringing her into our school, but uh, we, we will try. Uh, John Ryan is uh, chairman of the board, former CEO of Mind Safety Appliances. Welcome to Mr. Ryan. And, and you remember him from a speech that he gave to us as well last year. Uh, Richard Banziger is uh, Managing Director at Citigroup, heads Global Industries and Regional Markets Risk Manager, Management, uh, is also the former Vice Chairman of the CUA Board of Trustees. Welcome to Mr. Banziger. <laughs> and he's also an Econ graduate from our then department in 1981. Um, and Vic Sellier is uh, co-founder, former CFO of Argonne Engineering, and welcome to Mr. Sellier. So very delighted to have uh, the, the board members here. I do want to encourage as many of you as can to come up and say hi afterwards. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, Ambassador Novak is one of those people to whom it is given the, to change the course of history. I don't think I exaggerate when I say that. Not through the exercise of political or military power, but through the power of ideas. So he writes about the spiritual, spiritual foundations of economic and political systems and the moral ideals of democratic capitalism. He's written uh, almost 50 books, uh, written or edited almost 50 books in his lifetime. His works have been translated into every major Western language, as well as uh, Korean, Chinese, Japanese, and Bengali. I want to highlight um, some examples of the impact of his work. So before the collapse of the Soviet Union, his book, The Spirit of Democratic Capitalism, was translated uh, and published by underground presses in Poland and had a transformative effect on the solidarity movement there. Uh, in the former Czechoslovakia, the dissidents there used to gather secretly to read his works. Uh, proponents of democracy in Argentina and in Chile also turned to his works for, for guidance. In the UK, the former Prime Minister, Lady Margaret Thatcher, uh, credited him with providing the intellectual basis for much of her work. And in El Salvador, former President Alfredo Cristiani said that it was listening to Ambassador Novak speak and then reading his books that inspired him to run for the presidency and to work for just peace. Uh, Ambassador Novak in his early life considered himself a liberal, a progressive, um, but his experience in, in liberal environments led him to ever deeper dissent from those views, first on foreign policy issues, then on cultural issues such as labor union policies, abortion, the family, and crime. He became a trailblazer in what was to become known as the neoconservative movement. 
A neoconservative is sometimes defined as a progressive who was, quote, mugged by reality. Uh, Michael defines it as a progressive with three teenage children, which I suppose <laughs> is more or less the same thing. Right? <laughs> um, and uh, so he was appointed three times a US ambassador by President Ronald Reagan, has received nu numerous awards, including 26 honorary degrees, and the prestigious Templeton Prize for progress in, in, in religion. Um, so you're all students in business and economics. Um, you may or may not be familiar with the Templeton Prize, but as students in business and economics, you understand what a big deal is. it is when I tell you that it comes with a purse of a million dollars. So that was a nice prize to get, <laughs> and very well deserved. Uh, but closer to home, you may not realize just how much of what you have here in the School of Business and Economics was influenced by tonight's speaker. So years ago, a young high school student was trying to figure out what to do with his life. He was thinking of a career in business, but not sure if that would fit with his Catholic faith. He read Michael Novak's book, The Spirit of Democratic Capitalism, and then later on had the opportunity to spend a summer working as a research intern for, for, for Ambassador Novak. And then subsequently, um, uh, that led to a successful career in business as an entrepreneur. Uh, later on, he sold his company, sold several patents, and started a second very successful career in fundraising. That person is Phil Brock, who is the assistant dean for development for our school. Some years later, another young person, also entrepreneur, was recovering from a very nasty experience that he had when his own startup was acquired for hundreds of millions of dollars by a company that turned out to be a fraud. Uh, his stock, its stock went to zero and all the money was gone. This young entrepreneur ended up questioning the whole idea of free markets and entrepreneurship. Uh, then he read Michael Novak's book, Business as a Calling, which led to a renewed confidence and, and gave him the moral energy to get up and try again, and then this time was, was successful, and successful many times again. That uh, young entrepreneur, former young entrepreneur, is also here, and you know him as our director of entrepreneurship, Andreas Widmer, Professor Widmer. Another young person uh, work, was working as a management consultant in New York City, and, and struggling in a different way, this young person had abandoned any form of religion while still in high school and was now going through a, a process of reversion, if you will, uh, rediscovering his Catholic faith, but also wondering how to re reconcile that Catholic faith with his work as a management consultant, where he was in the process of, of laying off 10,000 people. Um, and, and one evening, walking down Fifth Avenue, uh, passing Brentano's bookstore, came across a very large display of Michael's book, The Catholic Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, uh, bought a copy, read the book, and started to see how being a faithful Catholic can, uh, in fact, go very well with a, a successful career in business. Became so interested in these ideas that he later went on to get a PhD and start an academic career, and eventually became the founding dean of our school, so that's me. So, so the, the <laughs> So Michael, your influence on our school is, is bigger than perhaps you can ever know. Everyone, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Ambassador Michael Novak. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you all very, very much. Uh, I need to give you a warning, though. Uh, my first teaching position was at Stanford University. And one of the glories of Stanford is it starts to get warm in about February. And I, I was a very young teacher, and I had a class of about nine. And one beautiful day at the very beginning of March, one of the young women suggested, why don't we meet at the swimming pool? Well, I was very young and impressionable, and I allowed it. And when we got over to the pool, it was the Palo Alto pool, not the university one. Uh, we were sitting, sitting around and getting adjusted to the beginning of work, and one of the young women was twirling her nose plug so, and it plopped into the water. Uh, at which all the young men jumped up ready to dive in and retrieve it for her. She said, stop, I want Professor Novak to get it. <laughs> well, as I say, I was very young. And, naive, and I said, why me? And she looked at me with one of those cold looks that only a woman can give you. 
and said, because I don't know anybody who can dive down deeper, stay down longer, and come up drier. So, <laughs> a warning to you. The Catholic University is a place sacred to me. I loved reading of the lay initiatives in its beginnings and the brilliant papers presented at a founding conference during the first year of its existence, resuming the history of the first hundred years of, American, of Catholicism in America. I studied here for two terms in 1958 and 1959 and had the privilege of studying with Monsignor John Tracy Ellis, Robert Trisco, Paulist father Jean Burke, the legendary Monsignor Joseph Fenton, and the well-known redemptorist Father Francis Connell. And I've come back here to give more than one series of lectures that later became books. Today there is a special day. We are here marking the first anniversary of the Catholic University of America's School of Business and Economics. And business is the most strategically central vocation in the whole field of social justice. The business vocation is the main hope of the one billion human beings around the world who are still locked in poverty. The business vocation is the main support of the multitude of institutions of civil society, the main support of private universities, cancer clinics, soup kitchens, symphonies, hospitals for the poor, sports activities both in neighborhoods and in major cities, service organizations such as the Lions Clubs, the Rotary, Kiwanis, the Elks, the support of religious activities without number. Without business corporations, there would be no great power standing between associations of citizens and the Leviathan of the administrative state. Without business, there would be only a very weak private sector indeed. Today though I want to begin with a simpler theme, an evangelical theme. Think about this for a moment. What was the vocation that from all eternity the Lord God Creator chose for his only son, born of humankind? The Lord God Creator called the Christ, the Redeemer, to shoulder the vocation of small business, a creative vocation, a vocation of humble service to nearly every human household. When he was the age of most of you in this room then, Jesus was helping run a small business. There on a hillside in Nazareth, he found the freedom to be creative, to measure exactly, and to make beautiful wood pieces. Here he was able to serve others, even to please them by the quality of his work. Here he helped his family earn its own way. Creativity, exactitude, quality, beauty, service to others, independence. This was the substance of his daily life in preparation for all that was to come. Like Christ, each of you too has been given a calling. Before time was, the Lord knew thee by name and called you. The problem now is to recognize your calling and do what you have been made to do. But how does a young woman recognize her own calling? How does a 20-something guy learn what he was made to do? Listen to your own heart. Ask three questions. What are your abilities in their full range of upward possibilities and sometimes harder to grasp when you're young, your limitations? Which activities do you most enjoy? And third, what would you love to be doing your whole lifetime? These are three signs of what God made you to do, fitted you to do. But there's a catch. Many others may want the same things you do. 
To prove that you are reading correctly what God wants you to do, you must have worked really hard and prepared yourself even better than they. And you need a providence who has seen to it that circumstances are in favorable array so that you are in the right place at the right time and make the right moves when the chance comes. God helps those who help themselves, but still, he must open the opportunity to those who do help themselves. We need lots of prayers all our life for his guidance and his blessings on our behalf. Now life's not a rose garden, no one promised that. We must earn our way by the sweat of our brow. We are told that this is a veil of tears, much disappointment and much sorrow in it. So in seeking to answer your own call, you must pray constantly for light and for the best preparation you can undertake. The deeper you dig your foundations in your youth, the higher you can build in the future. I am forever grateful to the man who told me that when I was very young. But why choose business as a vocation? Business is perhaps the most common vocation of Christians around the world. Probably used to be farmers, but today it's business in all its multiple kinds. And it's a desperately needed vocation. After the human race was born naked and poor, for millennia, there were no industries, settled farms, cities, established businesses in which to seek employment and earn a modest income. Even two centuries ago, there were fewer than one billion persons on this planet in the entire human population. Nearly all of them were poor. And in France, one of the more developed nations, most were called Les Miserables. Today, there are just over seven billion people on Earth. Since World War II, enormous strides have been taken in liberating billions of them from dire poverty. But there are still just over one billion human beings living at primitive levels of income under $2 per day, $700 per year. Though I do remember that my father in the Depression in Johnstown, Pennsylvania was earning $3 a day. And most of these one billion who were living at $700 a year or less. Of them, almost all are unemployed or underemployed. Their only real hope of getting out of poverty is the launching of about 200 million new small businesses. Without jobs, how can the poor raise their income? But where will all these, three, these 200 million small businesses come from? Until recently, the poorest regions of the world were Asia, Africa, and some parts of Latin America. Since 1980, however, China and India have been transforming their economies from socialist to capitalist. They have raised more than half a billion persons out of poverty. Never have so many been lifted out of poverty in so short a time. And they've prodded them into a steady upward movement of income and for them, striking prosperity. Thus, Asia has jumped ahead of Africa in economic development. And now Africa is the poorest region in the world. In these areas, large swathes of the planet are not yet favorable to large industries or corporations. In such regions, the only hope of full employment lies in the formation of small businesses. Indeed, in such regions and in many others, the best annual message of economic progress is the rate of new business formations. I want to repeat that because it's 
when you're checking how your country is doing. Venezuela, say, or anywhere else. Well, Venezuela is in a bad political situation now. But when you're checking how your country is doing, check the rate of new business formations this year as against last year. If that's an upward tick, things look good. If it's not, you're not, you're spinning your wheels. Even in developed nations, most jobs are found in small business. In Italy, over 80% of the working population works in small business. In the US, the proportion is just about 50%. But 65% of the new employment is in small businesses. The new employment. During the great economic expansion of 1981-89, the US added to its economy the equivalent of the whole economic activity of West Germany at the time. 16 million new jobs were created in the US. 16 million in eight years. The vast number of them in small businesses. Startups peaked as new businesses came into being at a rate of 13% as a proportion of all businesses, an all-time high. There were thousands of new businesses every week, hundreds of thousands in a year. Much the same happened under Clinton in 1993-2001, so it's nonpartisan. But it was even better under Clinton than under Reagan. 23 million new jobs were created. Who knew they'd all be special prosecutors? Uh, <laughs> in the creation of small businesses, you are very young. <laughs> in the creation of small businesses, four factors are necessary. First, especially in the third world, ease and the low cost of incorporation. So you can incorporate a business. In Hong Kong, it averages about, the government has to reply to a request within a month. And it costs about $30 a day. I mean, no wonder Hong Kong is just bustling with new businesses. And not so very long ago, we had a gross national product it wasn't national, but a gross national, equivalent of a gross national product. Some high proportion of all of China's, just this little rock, it didn't even have water, its own water or electricity. But it had lots of small business. Second, you need access to inexpensive credit. Credit is the mother's milk of small business. If you're a poor person, you have a great idea, you can't get it launched unless you have some money from somebody else. And um, that's not available in most of the world. Third, institutions, you need institutions of instruction and technical help, such as the system of local credit unions in the US and, and savings and loans, and the steady assistance of the extension services of the A&M universities, which Abraham Lincoln insisted on every new territory must have a university of agricultural and mining. Why? Because he saw that the cause of wealth is kaput, the old head, the old noggin. You just think about it. Almost everything in this room has been invented since the Patent and Copyright Act. That's the act that Lincoln said changed the world. For the first time in history, it moved the fulcrum, the center of economic activity, from the farm, from land, to the mind and open up all kinds of new possibilities. But the lights in here, the, the materials of the ceiling, the rugs on the floor, the microphone, almost everything we, almost every place we look for income in the US, any job we look for, has been invented. It's the mind is the source of the wealth of nations. And fourth, fourth requirement, is you need a population, throughout the population, habits of creativity. People looking for something new to be done. We're made in the image of the creator, and that's simply becoming who we are. And enterprise, a word we use far more frequently in America than is used in the United Kingdom, 
Why? Because when the first settlers started to come here to Virginia or to Massachusetts, there were no holiday inns waiting for them. There were no churches descending from the ninth century. There were no schools. If they wanted a roof, if they wanted a school, if they wanted a church, if they wanted it, they had to build it. You darn well better have lots of enterprising people. Enterprise means people who look around, see what could be done, and then have, they have the stick to witness another American word which I dearly love. Stick to witness to see that it's done through all kinds of failures and hardships. Okay. Economic development is propelled, as John Paul II said, by know-how, know -how, technology, and skill. Centesimus is honest, section 32. Therein, perhaps, lies the greatest entry points for Americans and others who wish to help poor nations by proffering assistance in economic development from the bottom up. In this regard, no one knows more about the ways to prod economic development in the poorest region of the world than your own Professor Andreas Widmer, who has vast experience in this area and has set in motion institutions to accomplish this work. But let me add a couple humble examples of my own. In Rwanda, a layman from Slovakia spent the better part of two years helping villagers in very poor areas organizing projects to develop the local region's water supply. One of the great handicaps of Africa and of China too is a tremendous shortage of water, potable water. And he helped bring in money and volunteers for building new schools. In Bangladesh, an American company donated cell phones that missionary priests could distribute to remote villages and by which the rice growers there could pinpoint the best local markets for selling their rice from week to week. Local villagers would pay small amounts to use the phones so that the cost of the phones could be returned and new phones made available for people elsewhere. In Panama, some years ago, Archbishop McGrath received a substantial grant from a family in Switzerland to open a rotating fund from which poor villages could borrow money. In one village, such a loan was used to purchase a truck that was used to carry produce, fresh flowers, and other goods down into Panama City and to return with other goods. Nearly all families in the village benefited by increased trade and higher incomes. The money paid back to the lender was then lent to other villages in need. That's the rotating fund. In Rio de Janeiro, an enterprising woman in one of the poorest favelas acquired a small stove on which she kept heated a kettle of porridge and an oven in which she baked fresh bread. The families in the neighborhood, favelas are these shacks put together with wood, whatever there is, pieces of metal as people crowd in from the countryside. It used to be able to live on an acre and grow enough food, but nowadays food's not enough. You need medical care, you need a lamp so the kids to study by. Uh, there's all sorts of new needs that it's not enough just to put stuff in the belly and live on a, an acre or two. So they're pouring into the cities by the millions. So uh, the neighbors were desperately poor and this simple provision of nourishing porridge and good bread raised their standard of living significantly. <laughs> neighbors paid small sums for these foods, they didn't come free, from which the enterprising woman bought new supplies for the morrow. A small group of Americans pitched in and bought her much larger ovens, multiplying her work. A church group in America later arranged for a pharmacist retiring from their parish to spend some months in that favela to set up a small pharmacy and to make contacts in the U.S. for fresh supplies. And to their credit, the pharmaceutical companies do an immense amount of bringing of fresh supplies of medicines uh, to the poorest regions of the world. Now the point of giving assistance to women and men of enterprise in poor regions may be solidarity with those in need. But the point of new businesses is to create new wealth in these poor environments. Increased local economic activity helps each new business grow. A business enterprise is not a lonesome cowboy. 
It's part of a social organism, necessarily networking with many, networking with many other players. Business enterprises are necessarily social. They need investors, workers, customers, suppliers, marketplaces. In this way, markets are one of the most fundamental of all social institutions, even more universal than political bodies. I think that's a fact very few people notice. And if I may emphasize, we make a mistake when we talk about the individual as the center of Western civilization. There's some truth to that, but it's embedded in the social organisms we create, the first of which is the market. Everything, Americans did not come here as lonesome cowboys. They came here building villages and towns. We're the great communitarians of the world and we make a mistake in branding ourselves as individualists. It's just not the truth. And um, Pope Francis would benefit by having an advisor who explains some of this to him. I'm not advertising for a job, I'm retired. But, um, markets of necessity must be law-abiding and dependent on at least minimal levels of moral trustworthiness. Even nomads need markets. The ancient and medieval thinkers recognized the centrality of city-states and other political bodies, Aristotle on the polis. Aristotle gave prominence to the economic activities of households, but had much less to say about markets as an international network with its own practical principles, analogous to but not the same as the principles of politics. I wrote a lot of speeches for a lot of politicians and I can just report to you that we had to meet with academics and experts, we had to meet with business people and wealthy people to raise money and we had to meet with clergy and artists and so forth. And I can tell you these three groups don't like each other. Uh, the politician listening to the businessmen or people he was trying to raise money from would would every so often in the dinner raise his eyebrows, oh my God. And of course the businessman was thinking, I don't understand these politicians. I don't understand how they think, I don't understand how they act. And the clergy and the educators and the artists think they're superior to both. <laughs> and neither one of them can stand those folks. It's meant to be that way. Our motto is, in God we trust. That means nobody else. Uh, for everybody else, there are checks and balances. And Okay. Um, the, the fundamental idea behind America that makes it, makes it successful is the recognition of universal sin. Every human being sometimes sins. So don't trust any of them with too much power. Set up a, an alternative, a watchdog. Okay. Further, we must keep reminding ourselves that the point of assisting entrepreneurs to open new businesses is to generate a culture of entrepreneurship and new wealth. The point is to stimulate scores of thousands of women and men. In some countries, especially in Latin America and in Africa, women take better to entrepreneurship than men. For economic growth, it is necessary to stimulate scores of thousands of women and men to look around their countries to assess economic needs. What small manufacturers, businesses, and services need to be created to improve the lives of their fellow citizens? Then they must begin creating such businesses almost out of nothing. Are there enough pharmacies spread throughout the population? Are there medical clinics? Are there hospitals? All these can be developed as thriving businesses since their need is universal. One can imagine building, even in poor countries, a chain of pharmacies, such as a modest version of Walgreens or of LifePoint hospitals. Similarly, a business model for improving education is often far more successful than state-run systems. Everybody in the poorest regions needs tables and chairs, lamps, dinner plates, cutlery, bath towels, a whole range of goods that improve home living. Most of these can be supplied by local, small local manufacturers. 
trucking companies are needed. I once met a man who actually became CEO of Coca-Cola, who had had a course in social justice at Notre Dame under the legendary Father Pugh. And when he was assigned, his first assignment in Coca-Cola, not his first, but soon, uh, was organizing Coca-Cola in Africa. And he made a point of putting Africans in jobs taught them to drive, to run the trucks, taught them at every level of business. He didn't have to do that from Coca-Cola, it cost more. But he said it's a building for the future. And he did it. And it worked. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to say there's no, not necessarily, there can be, but there's not necessarily a contradiction between the highest motives and the greatest advance of the common good that you can achieve in a, in a region. Um, everybody in the poorest regions, I'd said that already. And the task of the entrepreneur is, is to take these visions, these possibilities, and use down-to-earth imagination and practical experience in making them work. It's not enough to have beautiful ideas. You gotta make them work. And that's where the sweat comes in. There are fortunes to be made in the poor regions of the world whose worth can be used for ever more investment, donations to cultural institutions, and help for many different branches of civil society, including local citizens groups. Think what a great vocation it would be to place oneself in solidarity with the poor of the world by setting up networks of assistance to small business formations in this or that poor country or region. And pick one out and develop it well rather than spread all over. In order to help lift its peoples from unemployment and its resulting poverty. Such poor persons need small amounts of startup money, technical and practical support, instruction in many bookkeeping or other business skills, and links to the wider world. What a great work a new generation of young Americans could produce, speeding up the move of the last billion human beings to break free from poverty. We have to understand we're part of a story. We started with seven billion poor, let's say, in modern times. And we have moved six billion out of poverty, slowly but steadily, often with spurts as after World War II. And we've got a billion to go. Um, and that's, in a way, our most important task in this generation. In the real world, to get a vast movement of economic development underway, financial incentives are an important practical incentive. A few may work for charitable reasons, but for the great number of economic activists, financial rewards better ignite the fire of motivation. And almost universal economic activism adds so much to the common good of poor societies. Economic activism, let me underline. Adds so much to the common good of poor societies that it seems just and fitting to reward those who take the necessary risks and commit themselves to working extra long hours. It is no wrong thing for people everywhere to work for the financial betterment of their own households, neighborhoods, and countries. Breaking the chains of poverty in the US. Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty is now 50 years old and the 80 some different government programs which constitute it have spent more than $20 trillion adjusted for inflation since the 1960s. Today, however, the percentage of the poor, about 16%, remains almost the same as in Johnson's day. And the raw number of the poor, more than 50 million people now, is much greater than it was in Johnson's time, partly because of the growth of our population. Of course, too, the ranks of the poor in America are increased every year by the million or more legal immigrants who come here, not to mention the illegals. In other words, our poor people are being constantly uh, renewed, uh, growing from the bottom up. And that's wonderful because most of them in 10 years are no longer poor. Uh, almost all of our families in this room have been through that process. 
in the last hundred years. If the nation, our nation, simply gave every person in America enough money to get out of the statistical ranks of the poor, it would cost a lot less than the $20 trillion we've already paid. My friend Charles Murray at AEI has a proposal to give everybody $20,000 right off the bat. Comes with birth, accessible to you after you're 21 or something like that. So every, everybody starts with a little capital pool. You eliminate poverty instantly. There's no more poverty. Of course, we know that the habits of people wouldn't allow that to remain that way. Um, but the point is, our current programs are not only not achieving their goals, but also spending money far in excess of the amount needed to eliminate poverty. Um, Thomas Sowell, the great economist of our time, says that uh, curing poverty through the government is like feeding the swallows through horses. Um, um, okay. Uh, it's all right to laugh. It's a good line. You don't get many of those in life. Um, worse than that, our current programs are also doing a great deal of harm, encouraging millions of citizens to fall into something worse than poverty, notably habits of dependency and irresponsibility for their own well-being. That's much more destructive. Now, I want to hasten to point out that the condition of elderly people since the war on poverty is vastly better than it was. It's the condition of the young where a tremendous amount of damage has been done. Government programs for the poor have contributed to an immense tide of births out of wedlock and the non-formation of families. The fastest growing segment of the poor in America consists in unmarried women and the children they have born out of wedlock. It's the greatest abandonment by men of women and children in history. But it's just a horrific thing that we're living through. Whatever you think of the morality of such behavior, the social costs for the children are measurable and immense. Even the president said this yesterday. From the point of view of the business community, the main attack on poverty must come from the creation of some 16 million new jobs. That's what we need in the US. Why? Because today, 11 million Americans are unemployed. 11 million. And another 5 million or so have dropped out of the labor force altogether. In the Reagan administration, it was just the reverse. The proportion of people looking for jobs jumps way up because the proportion of people who had jobs reached an all-time high in American history. The percentage of adults who were working for income. Moreover, a few million more find fewer hours of work than they need. Therefore, in America, we need to create at least five million new small businesses to bring Americans who want to work into full-time employment. Poor people cannot get out of poverty if they do not have full-time work at a wage that with at least two workers combined carries them together above the poverty line. You know, the cure for poverty really is work, jobs. And the other thing, the cure for poverty is being married, staying married. And the other, th the third, if you do these three things in America, get married, stay married, even if not on the first try, finish high school, which is mandatory and paid for, and work 50 weeks a year, even at the minimum wage. If you do those three things, the government statistics will show you that there will be 96% of people who will get out of poverty. Three simple things. High school, marriage, and work. It's not rocket science. It's right there in the figures. Okay. Uh, during the last six years, the formation of new small businesses has drastically slowed. This despite the fact that a vast pool of capital is waiting to be invested. 
A few million young people want to start businesses. One of them came up to me here today, which I was really thrilled to hear, but have found economic conditions for starting a business much too unfavorable. The very activity even seems looked down upon. Meanwhile, many people oriented towards state programs do not grasp the fact that in order to have more employees, we must have many more employers. I mean, it's embarrassing to have to say that. But it's just widely overlooked. I mean, when I was more on the left, I didn't understand that. It hit me late. It's so obvious. We must encourage the high spirits of entrepreneurs who will, despite the risks, plunge into the founding of new businesses. Ask yourself, if you had $10,000 gift from a relative, on graduation, would you have the nerve to start a business and pop it all in there? Or, or whatever the amount. Uh, it, it, there's not much encouragement for that. And a lot, there's a lot of unfavorable things happening. A practical conclusion from all this, all of you, each of you, go out and start new businesses. You will greatly benefit the common good. And it is wise for society to promote handsome rewards for those who do benefit the common good so fundamentally and so richly. The point of such rewards is not selfish. It's rather to draw millions of others into launching the full 300 million new small businesses that the one billion remaining poor persons on earth need if they are to have any chance at all of escaping from poverty. If you want more of something, Reward it. If you want less, punish it. That's only common sense. But it took me so long to catch on to that. Um, okay, last point, civil society. If it's the main task of the vocation of business to break the chains of poverty, its second great contribution is to build up the strains of civil society. By civil society, we mean all those institutions outside the state whose members address a full range of social problems at every level of human activity, from the neighborhood to the national and international spheres. New businesses achieve this crucial goal from a point of view independent of the state and in immediate, and in immediate touch with the multiple purposes of a pluralistic society. The business community is the main source of financial contributions to these vital social institutions. If I ask those of you in the front row here who are from the world of business, just how many civic groups you support? How many things you're on committees for? It'd be breathtaking. That's the only place, independent of the state, that we can fund all our other activities. No business support, very little civil society. It's, it's the greatest contribution to democracy that business makes. A free society desperately needs large business corporations as a bulwark against the state. Otherwise, citizens would stand naked and alone against that vast power and that propaganda monopoly, which we see in so many places around the world. To escape total dependence on the state, to have financial resources for the institutions of civil society, a free society needs a powerful check on the self-aggrandizements of the state. The state's always interested in growing, not in limiting itself. It's the only part of life where the worse you do, the more money they pour in. And when you really do the job well, you're put out of business or you would be in the normal world. Um, so you have a vested interest in reporting how bad things are and getting worse. Um, anyway, it needs, a free society needs not only independent funds, but a source of well-tested public leadership and civic imagination that is much larger and more generous in its point of view than that of the state. I, I don't know of a city in America that hasn't benefited from a a civic-minded business community, a people of vision and know-how and able to get things done. 
and contribute not just money but their leadership and encourage people in their company to spend so many hours in leadership in these organizations. I mean, it's such a great resource for civil society. All these energies of civil society prevent the state from becoming omnivorous in its appetites and narrowly secular in its point of view. Without an enterprising, risk-taking, imaginative, creative community of businesses, large and small, but especially small, it is impossible to look forward to new job creation, impossible to imagine the survival of a free society. It is even harder to imagine a society that has dramatically broken the chains of poverty for every woman and man on earth. In short, to end as we began, new businesses are at the strategic center of the work of social justice in our time. Thank you very much.